Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sophia. I organize Spectrum Learning Events for you to build and bring the community together through learning at Spectrum. For those of you who are new to Spectrum, we are located at Duo Tower. So aside from providing event spaces, we offer curated workspaces for the community experience and connections to expand businesses. So very pleased today, in partnership with Arkstone, to run this webinar on digitalizing manufacturing, will Singapore remain competitive? I have with us uh, three panelists and a moderator. First up, Dr. Carlos Toro, the senior architect and research scientist at ARTC or Advanced Remanufacturing and Technology Center. So ARTC is led by ASTAR in partnership with NTU. So Dr. Carlos supports the implementation of the concepts related to the fourth industrial revolution in different mains, aerospace, FMCG, oil and gas, amongst others. His past experience include working in applied research, focusing industrial and advanced manufacturing. He also lectured at the University of the Basque Country. So he was also an invited researcher at University of Newcastle, Australia and returned with a Marie Curie Research Visitor Grant funded by the EU Commission. Next, I have Ethan Goh. He is a Market Product Specialist with Zig. Uh, he consults with clients on digital solutions for their business processes. In his leisure, he builds computers and is learning Lua. Zig is a market leader in Industry 4.0 technology with a portfolio of more than 40,000 products generating data which impacts human life. Next, I have Sun Chun Yen, sorry, Sun Chao Yen, the Division Manager, Information Development Services at Rovesis Asia. So Chao has more than 10 years experience with Rovesis. His work covers enterprise and manufacturing solution needs in multiple vertical markets in the Asia Pacific region, including pharmaceutical, agribusiness, FMB, petrochemical, and more. He also drives Rovisys's internal digitalization initiative, executing business plans, upskilling human capital, and enabling participation in digital transformation. Rovisys was founded in 1989 in Ohio, and the international office opens in 2005 in Singapore with over 900 employees in total. And last but never the least, who best to moderate this session is Wilson Ping, the CEO of Arkstone Private Limited. Arkstone was founded in 2013 by him after designing production simulation software for the world's largest biomanufacturers. So um, he is an industrial engineer by trade. He has implemented improvement projects in manufacturing industries ranging from aeronautics to smart industries ranging, sorry, aeronautics to smart meters pharmaceuticals, amongst others. So he is a recipient of Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia Award in 2016, and is heavily active as an Industry 4.0 and Smart Manufacturing Transformation Speaker globally. There you have it, very long credentials of our speakers. So without further ado, um, so audience, if you have any questions during the session, please post them onto the platform here. So Wilson, over to you, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sophia. And thank you so much, uh, Spectrum, for putting this together. I think we've really privileged to have three fantastic speakers that have an immense background coming in to kind of talk about what is really happening in the manufacturing space, not just within Singapore, but throughout the region. And just as a title that we're talking about here, digitalization is an important concept, and we're going to try to delve into this a little bit. But looking at how manufacturing has grown and evolved in Singapore, will it remain competitive? How do we keep it competitive? We've seen numbers recently coming out where we've seen growth even during the COVID environment of manufacturing within Singapore. But may it be masking, for instance, other industries that are actually on a downward slope? And how do we recover from those? And how do we make sure that the companies that are indeed growing right now remain competitive and can keep going because any competitive advantage now may not be tomorrow. And that's why digitalization plays a key role. The solutions that are required to actually enhance Industry 4.0 moving forward 
plays a key role. So a lot of this is what we're gonna to try to extract from these three gentlemen here that's gonna have immense knowledge from their background, from their organizations, from their institutes as well to drive this forward. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and thank you um, for our, our three panelists to join us as well. Let me go ahead and start off talking a little bit about Singapore itself. Now, one of the things that we've seen within Singapore is that there is an unfortunate disadvantage when it comes to certain areas in manufacturing, right? When you look at, for instance, manpower costs. That has always been a big complaint for a long, long time. And that's not going to change quickly or, or sometimes can never be changed. Uh, another example is uh, availability and land resourcing. If you're going to do large manufacturing here, does it even make sense from that standpoint? And then there are other things such as um, the cost of importing the materials to manufacture. Is that really the right place to do it? So there are inherent disadvantages when you look at it from the manufacturing space. Yet, if we look at how manufacturing has evolved and grown and strengthens itself in Singapore, it's actually quite impressing. You have immense research capabilities here. You have immense ability to produce high-end products and to produce precision products and timely products in, in, in a really rapid manner. You have great IP protection here. You have great multinationals that work here as well. So what I wanted to first open up the question here is, do you see something like this still being able to sustain moving forward? And if, and if not, what would certain things need to be done in order to keep that kind of rigor and that power of a manufacturing base within Singapore? Who would like to start us off first? Dr. Carlos, shall we begin with you and looking at it from the standpoint of the ARTC? Yes, definitely. I think, um, thank you, Wilson. Uh, I think the question is very interesting. I believe uh, Singapore has a, uh, as you correctly mentioned, uh, has uh, certain disadvantages, right? But I tend to believe that uh, Singapore has uh, transformed those disadvantages into opportunities, right? So I have seen a very vibrant a, uh, ecosystem of SMEs working in a, with us in ARTC, right? And uh, in Singapore, Singapore is actually very supportive uh, for those SMEs to grow up. I'm talking about really small SMEs up to SMEs that are, have grown to be uh, a, a proper name in the market, like Austin, for instance, that you did. So I believe um, our role in applied research is uh, is very interesting, right? Because um, I have done research in Europe, I have done research in in, uh, in Australia, I have done research in the US, right? And what I have seen in Singapore that calls my attention pretty much is the fact that uh, it is real applied research. So what we do here in the RTC is being transformed, is being translating into the industry, into the companies we work for, um, as a realistic approach, right? So the role of uh, our research uh, approach here is very, very tangible. And this is something that is clearly an advantage, right? The other thing that I would like to, to mention is that I've seen lots of uh, Industry 4.0 implementations around the world, right? Um, and when we started doing Industry 4.0 uh, in Spain, back in the, I, I come from the Basque country, right? The north of Spain, or south of France, uh, as you wish. You, you may decide which country it is, but anyway. Um, <laughs> the situation is, <laughs> yeah, the Basque is pretty, interesting people, right? So they actually started implementing Industry 4.0 back in 2012, right? And uh, the reality is that uh, the Basque country is mostly an automotive region, right? So of course, copying the German model was a no brainer, right? And it worked. What I've seen is that other countries are trying to copy the German model blindfold and it doesn't work because they are not Germany, they are not German, they don't have the same business that the Germans are trying to cope with. Singapore is not doing that. Singapore is taking a look of whatever everybody's doing in the world and just getting whatever is best, adapting to their own infrastructure, to their own culture, to their own companies, to their own reality, to their own people. And this is what makes Singapore very successful. I believe um, research uh, is playing a very important role, uh, but also it is a very balanced ecosystem. And I believe this is very, very interesting, right? I, I think it's, 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 it's something that makes this country completely outstanding. I, I'm uh, inclined to agree with you exactly on this. I am a huge champion of the ARTC. Obviously, from Arkstone's standpoint, we've seen tremendous success by working in a collaborative manner. I think that's kind of the most important thing that you brought up here, which is cookie cutter solutions do not work. I think folks who are trying to do a copy paste solution is actually probably shooting yourself in the foot because you <clears throat> yeah. really need to understand your own organization, understand your own company culture, understand the region around you, 
and then apply the tool sets that are the best of the best around the world, right? Let's not focus yep. on a jack of all trades. Let's find the best solutions around yep. and integrate yep. accordingly. And this integration concept, I think, is what really will ensure that Singapore remains competitive. Is that we're not, you know, kind of tied down to have to use a particular solution. It's really about finding what's the best amongst the industry, working with groups and agencies like the ARTC to blend them together for the right and perfect tools for your own internal organizations. Yep. Which I think this naturally leads really uh, nicely to, to, to the Rovasis team, which is a child looking at how you take the role of IT and OT, which is something that people have been fighting with actually quite a bit. There's always a, a divide between uh, uh, the OT and the IT section, which is how do you get the hardware and the components and the actual manufacturing process to connect then with your traditional infrastructure and your IT work that you need, because you need both hand in hand to, to be able to run all these technologies that are flying all over the place. And from a systems integrator's perspective, it gets pretty confusing as well because the number of solutions is just ginormous. How have you seen this being tackled, at least from the Singapore context and the regional context for Rovisys and any best practices that you've seen that has been helpful for manufacturers as well? Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for the question. So to begin to answer those questions, I think uh, the key, the key part when people are people are talking about digital transformation, talking about digitalization, the the starting point would be to collect data, and I think that is going to be the hardest and most painful uh, step, uh, as we see as data integration. So, um, you know, just just from experience from a system in, in integration uh, perspective, uh, we have had to collect data from legacy systems some 20, 30 years old. We see a lot of them. Like even in Singapore, you know, definitely, yeah, there are definitely easier ones like uh, modern systems where functionalities for seamless, seamless integrations are already built in, um, like the availability of uh, RESTful API or uh, uh, OPC UA. And, you know, getting past that first step is really uh, crucial. And we've helped customers with uh, collecting those data digitally um, through web interfaces, uh, collecting data using sensors like uh, what um, Ethan uh, over here uh, is good at. Um, so I think that is that is really a, a key uh, stepping stone to uh, being able to bring more uh, to the table. Yeah, the, the data collection process, I think you've hit on a really important note here as well, is that a lot of the hindrances for people to move towards Industry 4.0 is the kind of disparate systems that are in place, right? I have a machine that's 30 years old and has no controller and I can't really get any data from it. But then just last week, I bought in a new machine that has the latest and greatest and has open standards that they're using. It may be OPC, it may be web APIs that we can easily call, and that, that's easy one to integrate. But I mean, I'm not going to go throw away my 30-year-old machine. It's still working and it's still running. And from a financial standpoint, it doesn't make sense to throw away. So getting that information from these particular systems usually ends up being a true bottleneck in terms of being able to really advance and leverage a lot of tools. So when we talk about working with you know, advanced functionalities, uh, there's this conception that when most folks think about Industry 4.0, they think, oh, I, I, I need AI here, I need machine learning there, I need an AGV here, I need a cobot there. But in actuality, Industry 4.0 starts with the fundamentals of getting that visibility across the supply chain and your manufacturing site and your shop floor first and then adding all these kind of nice bells and whistles on top, which then naturally leads to how do we better collect information becomes the foundational part of being able to succeed. So in order to remain competitive, we got to be able to digitalize our older systems, get real-time data from older systems. So this naturally easily kind of uh, moves over to, to Ethan, which is a great question now to look at. In terms of sensorization, in terms of extracting real information from a shop floor or from a particular process without the need for human intervention is going to play a big role in us being able to build out this infrastructure. What do you see within the context of Singapore and the region of how sensorization is going to be changing? Where do you see new advancements? How will uh, SMEs, for instance, be able to leverage some of these kind of capabilities coming out to help them build this foundational layer? Yeah, um, to, to, to answer, or maybe before answering those questions, um, we, we come back again to, to your very first question about, you know, um, mm. is, this, is this sustainable for, for Singapore manufacturing? Um, and, and there are many factors mm. for that. Um, 
but we come back to what I believe is one of the main factors. Um, you know, if, if, you put, if you are a Singapore manufacturer, um, if you are an SME, um, I think one of the major factors would be productivity, productivity, productivity. So, so companies which increase productivity, um, they get ahead. Uh, they get ahead of the competition. Um, they, they succeed, basically. Uh, companies which don't increase productivity, um, e eventually find themselves, um, you know, losing ground in, in certain areas. And, and so this, this comes back to the, to the question that you asked, you know, um, where do we see uh, sensors now playing a part uh, in maybe answering this question of helping manufacturers to increase productivity? So, so one thing has been, um, you know, mentioned already, which is, um, that of creating that transparency. Uh, of course, starting with the first step of collecting data. So collecting data uh, from the shop floor, you know, virtualizing that data, um, making it as automated as possible. Because of course, um, you know, uh, yes, um, a simple step, of course, would be a, a manual entry, and that's fine. That's that's perfectly good if if uh, that is an entry level. But of course, you know, with 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 manual entry, we also have some human error, uh, which is possible to be um, actually so called uh, introduced. And so maybe we can try to automate that as well um, by using sensors to collect the data, which otherwise would be manually input uh, by by a user. Um, and so being able to do that supports that transparency. It, it, it gives um, the, the management level uh, or the strategic level of these SMEs, um, you know, transparency into how can we increase the product productivity. Um, in the first place, you know, what is my cycle time for this process? And then now I try to understand that. Why is the cycle time so, so, so long? How can I improve that? So what would be the trend, um, you know, um, to, to come back to your question, what, what would be the trend of sensors in the future? Um, you, you mentioned that the, the playing field is not level. You know, we exactly, we have uh, machines which are legacy machines. We also have machines which are new ones. So um, if we look at sensors as a data collector, um, and the fact that sensors, uh, you know, SIG is working very hard to enable the integration of sensors uh, separate from the machine, right? So if you have a legacy machine, nobody wants to touch the PLC. The machine is working fine, the control is, is working fine, and um, in many cases, maybe even the original PLC programmer is, is, is lost, right? Um, so being able to independently and automatedly, um, you know, automatically collect the data from the machine by using sensors, uh, bypassing the PLC when required, and then providing that connectivity to the higher level system. So this is one of the trends of sensorization, which uh, we do foresee will um, help the productivity side. Um, one last trend of sensorization is also uh, something which is um, tied very much to productivity, um, which is actually actually flexibility. Um, flexibility in the sense of um, now looking at these sensors as not just uh, static devices that are just there to collect data, uh, but now looking at sensors as devices which can talk and which can listen. So for example, if we are looking at productivity, um, one of the main tenets of productivity is that I want my production line to be flexible. Um, it must be able to be dynamic it must be able to produce, uh, you know, maybe more than one item. And uh, when, when, when that comes into play, um, being able to talk to the sensor and tell the sensor that, hey, you know, at this moment, the item is changing. So your parameters and your configuration has to change automatically as well. Um, that's another big step in the, in, in, the, in the right direction of productivity. So transparency is one. Um, flexibility is another one. Mm. Productivity, transparency, and flexibility. I like. I love those words. Those are very key words. Uh, Dr. Carlos, you had something to add to this. Yeah, yeah, I will. I think it's uh, it's uh, very interesting what Ethan just mentioned. I believe uh, if uh, you're looking at uh, what is going to happen in the next following years, right? Uh, just just take a look back, right? When we started the motor factory in ARTC uh, almost four years ago, right? Uh, the big issue was how to get data, right? 
it was very, very difficult, right? There was a lot of brownfield. Uh, the communication protocols were just uh, kind of incipient, right? Uh, so it was a, a very big issue, right? But I'm seeing that uh, the sensors are being more important nowadays than they used to be, right? As uh, Ethan is, is, is mentioning. So the real question is, uh, and if you will allow me to use the word, right? I think data is the new normal, right? So what is going to happen with data? What are you going to do when you have that amount of data, right? So potentially we, you will end up with potentially gigabytes of information, right? These data points. What is the meaning of these data points? Can you productize that data, right? Because data won't take you anywhere if you are not able to do anything with it, right? You need to do something, right? And that something will create very interesting and relevant new business models, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe uh, Singapore is doing very well in, in, in a collection of this information, right? Like data, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about information because we know how the data is being used, right? So we're going to the next level, right? What are we going to do? Can we create something out of this data that makes us have a new business model to start something new? And I think this is, this is very important because the ecosystem is allowing you to do that, right? And SMEs are taking advantage of this. So yeah, I believe, I believe the yeah, data is the new normal. Fantastic. Yep. I think the important thing that you added there was really around the operationalization of the data, right? Just collecting data for the sake of collecting data isn't really that helpful. But the added value of leveraging that data for further improvements, for productivity, for new business models, you have to be able to action on it. If you don't action on it, it's basically you're just filling up the hard drive space. And I think it's a very important factor as well, which is that also means I think that you need a plan. Right? And you need to actually figure out from the beginning, if you're going to start sensorizing something, what is the information going to be used for and what can it be used for? Mm -hmm. Which naturally, I think, goes also into the, uh, the systems integration side, where you're going to start looking at a lot more customers coming to you. And you may have great examples of this as well, Chow, of yep. how do you work with, for instance, a customer that needs to actually plan out the strategy of what data do I need to collect? How am I going to use this data? And what is my expected KPIs? Do you have any case studies that you've gone through of perhaps interesting projects that you've seen great ways of how Rovasis or how a, a great system integrator walks through this journey with your, with your customers? Right. So uh, I think when we start talking about digitalization uh, with the customer, we need to understand and define two states. Well, uh, number one is the S8 state, what is currently in the, uh, in the facility and what is the 2B state. Well, uh, it might sound easy, but in practice, actually it's not. So we need to be understanding what systems and infrastructure that we have, um, and then start to think about how new infrastructure can come in to complement existing infrastructure to achieve what we want to achieve, right? Then there needs to be a roadmap to get from SAs uh, to the 2B. And, and that said, we have, um, we have seen in terms of pitfalls, uh, a lot of focus on the 2B like uh, what we're going to get, the bell, bells and whistles, how we're going to get predictive maintenance and all that. And, and people fail to pro properly plan that integration into the existing systems. And this actually results in a system that is not clean um, with custom connectivity ev uh, everywhere. And that cannot be good for maintainability and certainly not for scalability. So another problem that we typically see is the overlapping functionalities of um, software applications. Because when people go for software application, they will be tackling one problem at a time uh, using one, uh, soft, uh, one software application at a time instead of a unifying uh, application uh, platform. So, and another thing that we've seen as well is that people tend to look very far, like uh, just now when I mentioned about predictive capabilities, and they, feel, they fail to see um, low hanging fruits that will allow quick wins because when we talk about digitalization, we want to quickly get people on board, uh, quickly let, let people, uh, allow people to see the value of doing uh, su uh, such projects and what value does it bring to uh, the participants. So I think um, a lot of times when we engage customers, we want to see uh, this whole roadmap. We want to be able to draw that roadmap for the customers and get them from, from the assist uh, to the 2B. Sounds great. And I think this is something where you have mentioned, which is really important, um, is that it needs to be planned. It's not something where you just kind of say, oh, that looks nice. I saw it on the store shelf and I'll just buy it and I assume that right. it will work. It's that you actually went and 
helped customers through a roadmap and a, a you know, I, I, I know this word has been used too much already, <laughs> the journey, right? It definitely right. is a journey because the thing is, if you just went out and just grab something off the shelf, you're likely to be stuck in what is now proverbially known as the pilot purgatory, which is you have a project, it works great for three months and then no one knows how to maintain it afterwards. Or your process changes and just as Ethan, you were mentioning before as well, you're now running a new product and whatever device that you have installed there can no longer operate with this new product that you're running. And I think that one I wanna move back to you as well, Ethan, that you had something to add here about how you would look at this and what uh, what uh, Chow had just mentioned. How do you see that helping out and how do you work with uh, essentially a customer to go through that journey actually and, and get that into their mindset? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Wilson. Um, I, I laughed just now because that was the word in my mind. Um, journey was the <laughs> word in my mind. <laughs> it's overused. It's super cliche. I, I agree with you. Um, but it's true. It's true. Um, and and like Chow mentioned, you know, um, the roadmap. That that roadmap is so important. Um, what we do here at Zig is very similar. Um, so number one, we address um, the low hanging fruits by by really uh, focusing on what we call the MVP or the minimum viable product, let's get something uh, into the hands of the customers and, and get them using it. But of course, before we even do that, uh, as, as what Chow mentioned, you know, there's so many uh, steps, um, or there, there's so much, I wouldn't say steps, but like background work that has to be done. So, you know, um, assessing the current condition of the, cus uh, of, of the infrastructure is one. Um, the other one is, is really, um, you know, having a, a way or a methodology to expose the, the actual needs of the customer. Because in, in many times, uh, what we find, uh, what the customer wants uh, might not be really what he needs. And, and this kind of unfortunately leads us in a circle of, um, you know, where a lot of time and effort are wasted. So, so one methodology which we use to approach this is that um, we really dive down into the personas or, or what I would, I guess you would say is the role and responsibility of the users of this system. Um, we try to understand what KPIs they, they want to achieve. Um, you know, for example, a KPI cascade where, where you have a st strategic level KPI for the management. Um, you know, you, don't, you then have an operations level KPI for the supervisors. And then you have an action level KPI for the actual operators of the machine. Um, based on these personas or, or roles and responsibilities that we, that we actually work with the customer to identify, um, we then come up with the user stories. So, so the user stories um, are really coming from the users and the user story uh, helps us, or, or this, this um, methodology of collecting the user stories it takes time, but it actually helps us to identify the real needs of, of, the, of the user. And this allows us in the end to come up with the minimum viable product. And from there, it's just an um, iterative loop, right? Uh, something like DevOps. We, we just keep on collecting feedback, building it up. And um, so, so that's, yeah, that's something that I just wanted to add. No, that's great. I, I think uh, you're, you're uh, you know, Zik is moving towards a, uh, a software development environment kind of mindset, which is great, an agile methodology of iterating and essentially not accepting what is just done and seeing that that's, that's, that's done. It's, it, it's going to be an iterative process. Now, what's, what's very important, and I think a lot of you guys have touched on this, is that it seems to us right now, is that it's not necessarily a matter of, of a lack of technology that is kind of prohibiting Industry 4.0 to be widely adopted, especially from the Singapore context. And if we look into that, one of the things that I've actually used quite often is that, you know, Industry 4.0 adoption rate is not necessarily slowed down by a lack of technology, but it's actually slowed down by a lack of talent. And there's a lack of enough people that understand these skill sets and can leverage these skill sets and have the industry experience that's pairing everything between OT to IT to new technologies to some machine learning stuff, some AI stuff, and inside of the manufacturing realm. You know, you sure, you have a lot of folks focused on AI in different areas, but they may not be relevant within the manufacturing side. So that has been a big roadblock. And I think when you talk to a lot of SMEs, that's a big complaint that comes across as well. It's that it's not that they don't want to actually spend. They were actually willing to look at spending, but how do you sustain it, right? And how do you have your solutions that are there? How is that being sustained? So I want to pass this question along because it is a big pain point that I think a lot of uh, manufacturers face, not just here in Singapore, but, but regionally. But 
But from the ARTC's perspective, Dr. Carlos, how do you, how does this, this agency help tackle that particular problem? Especially when, again, it's, it's hard for someone to go out and bring in fresh talent who may not even understand what manufacturing really is. And how, how does a research agency like that help move either SMEs or larger multinationals along on this path? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting question. Wilson. I believe uh, one of the key relevant act, uh, activities in the RTC is the fact that uh, I, I believe my, my colleagues are pretty capable, right? Pretty, pretty bright minds, right? Uh, so ARTC takes uh, pride in hiring uh, people that is actually making a change. And it doesn't matter if the person is from an engineering perspective that is coming from, uh, I don't know, electronics or bio or whatever. I mean, it's like, um, it's a multicultural and multi-scientific and multi-multi-multi-team, right, that works together. And I think this is very interesting because um, in former times, right, uh, you will go to university, you study mechanical engineering, that's that's all you need, right? For your whole lifetime, you will go and work and you will spend your, your working hard lifetime working as a mechanical engineer. You don't need to learn anything new, right? But now, every technology changes over the couple of years, right? So ARTC is trying to bridge the gap of the value of that, right? No, the technology at this level, right? Where mm, five to eight, nine, is something that is very unknown. Things that are almost there, but they haven't reached uh, the maturity that uh, companies will kind of adopt with, right? So this is where everything matches, right? Like you have pretty competent people that is working on uh, highly evolved technologies, but just about to pop uh, out and into something that will be a product or something that become predictable, or something that can be achievable by industry, right? So this is where um, our, our PPP uh, approach comes in, right? Because we don't do research because we like to do research on the topic. If there is some question, some uh, matter to be answered from uh, one of our members or, or the companies that we work on, then we address it. So that means there is an to pull, right? So it is kind of coming from both sides and we are just in the middle, like a sandwich, right? So we have to struggle to create usable cases, usable scenarios for this. And uh, when I started in the RTC a few years ago, uh, almost four years ago, it, it, we had a leap time that was kind of um, lengthier than we have right now. Uh, what I have seen is that this time from the conception to the implementation in industry is getting shorter and shorter. Mm, and and this, is, this is very good because it makes us very uh, relevant by thinking of what we need to do, what we need to prioritize. And we need to be very, very cautious in listening to what industry is doing, right? But we have our, our feet on what is Richard's research doing. So we are working with universities as well. So I think this is, this is very interesting because it's part of the whole ecosystem that I was mentioning earlier on. And um, it brought us into a very interesting conclusions, right? And supporting companies like, like for instance, Oxen. I mean, uh, once again, I'm, I'm gonna use Oxen as a, as a case study because it is very successful what we have done with you guys. In, in a way, um, we've been able to actually help you develop new products. And this is a blessing for us, right? As a researcher by nature, this is the best thing that you can do. This is the best outcome, right? Something that you were just considering as a conceptual thing, seeing it into something that can be productized that some company will make profit out of it. This is, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. Um, and probably, and with this I will finish, I believe, um, this is possible because of, of the way Singapore is, is, is doing the things, right? And uh, it's possible because of the way that the Singaporean companies, the SMEs are, are looking at it. So it, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to, to support this way. I, I, I agree with you. And this is something where, you know, Arkstone has seen and have been able to work with the most capable and experienced and, and talented folks at the ARTC. And this is one of the things I think, you know, if within the context of Singapore, you have this capability with, to be able to work with such great research agencies and institutes that are able to um, add on to your existing kind of capabilities. One of the things that I think has, has become very evident, and I think from Arkstone's success as well, is that don't feel like you have to go at it alone. Collaboration is a very important thing here. And I think collaboration is not about just like, oh, I, I need to purchase a solution from someone. 
It's about sitting down together to work with systems integrators, to work with hardware providers, to work with institutes and software solutions, to actually see how do we bridge this and what better place in the ARTC to do this as you have the entire ecosystem of folks ready already there to be able to support you on this kind of journey. I think that's kind of the key difference now where before in the past, I think there was a mindset of folks where, you know, if you're looking at industry three, two, and one, it's more of something where you just go out and buy and then you get there. But it's a very kind of CapEx kind of involvement. Whereas now it's much more of a cultural mindset, innovative, collaborative environment where you want to get the best of the best. Just as we mentioned, you don't want a cookie cutter kind of solution. So this is a, a, a very, very true blessing, I think, of why manufacturing, at least in my mind, and I think there might be common agreement here, is that manufacturing will remain very strong and very positive within Singapore is because this ecosystem, which is so hard to build, is actually available here. So what I would like to turn to next then in this case is uh, with, with the Robus' team, as you guys are a, you're a fantastic system integrator that takes care of operations globally as well, not just within in Southeast Asia and Singapore. Have you seen similar things or how do you feel that you have to adopt your processes when you're working with customers, either in Singapore, or maybe somewhere within the region or maybe outside this region in the US or in, in Europe as well? Is there a distinctive difference of kind of how you would begin with these folks compared to what you would do here in Singapore in the region here? Right, I, I think um, everyone can be in agreement that um, Industry 4.0 shouldn't be a novel concept anymore, uh, especially in Singapore. Um, you know, compared to a few years ago, um, Singapore has necessary infrastructure and actually doing most than, than others to kind of incentivize manufacturers and the whole ecosystem to adopt and uh, implement technologies and advancement in the you know, industry 4.0 age. And what we have seen and what we've actually done uh, is that we do not have uh, local presence in all of the countries that, that we work with. We run projects from the, from the States, we run projects from Singapore, we run projects uh, in Europe, and everyone is in agreement that uh, the things that we are doing in terms of industry 4.0 can, can be done remotely as um, you know, especially with the COVID situation. So uh, Singapore really has all the ingredients uh, and we have, we have actually undertaken projects, um, you know, almost exclusively, exclusively out of Singapore. And, you know, when it comes to Industry 4.0, I think that, you know, all the multinationals, especially multinationals are already em embracing it. No one wants to get behind. And I think that trickles down to every tier of the supply chain, the vendors, the suppliers, uh, engineers, operators, managers, and so on and so forth. So uh, when we talk about, about a multinational supply chain, that actually brings, you know, brings in um, suppliers from everywhere, all, you know, all nations of the world. And when they see that the multinational and actually their paymasters are actually pushing for digitalization, I think that is when people, uh, no one wants to get left behind and they have to be em uh, embracing digitalization. Mm. Fantastic. I think that's kind of where we're seeing, you know, Industry 4.0 being the true merger of different regions, different spaces, different even industries that still need to connect to each other, even though they may be producing something very different, but it's still part of that component where you get that final finished good. So no matter where you are in the world, this is not something where you can hide from. And collaborating is one of the great ways to ensure that you remain relevant in this case as well. So when we talk uh, now moving over to kind of where we talked about collaboration. Now let's look at it from the context of a, a strong hardware and sensors provider. Zik has been a wonderful team that we've uh, had the privilege of working with from Arpstone as well together at the ARTC as well. And this is a wonderful thing where we see tremendous collaboration and openness, which is one of the true drivers of I think what's driving success as uh, hardware providers and solutions providers now is not that they were siloed and trying to push what they only want to push but to be open and, and uh, be able to iterate with their partners and collaborate in the system as well. Ethan could you give us a little bit more kind of what are some of the programs and strategies that Zik is looking at now to kind of broaden this collaboration initiative around the region and uh, globally as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Wilson. Um, I mean, one of the truths that we can all agree on is that um, Industry 4.0 um, digitalization, digital transformation, um, it's, it's not proprietary. It's definitely not proprietary. In fact, um, in, 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 in far to the opposite, it is, is democratic. 
right? Mm. Um, and 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 for that reason, um, you know, no one company can can really succeed on its own. Um, like you mentioned, collaboration is is really um, key to it. And from my point of view, the market is 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 huge enough, right? That it is this is not a tiny market that companies have to fight over. This is a huge, gigantic market that not many companies, um, no one company can cover all by itself. Um, so what are some areas where, where SIG is actually exploring this? Um, so one fantastic way, as you have already mentioned, is within ARTC itself. Um, we are also a member together, uh, but we are a tier two member in ARTC and um, the collab Collaboration, uh, you know, with ARTC bringing us to places where we couldn't have gone by ourselves. This is this is fantastic, um, and it has really actually um, helped us as a company, uh, as a local company. I might add. So I'm I'm talking here with a local hat. Um, it has actually helped us to to see the value of this partnership model, um, the the value of the collaboration model, um, and we can translate this. Um, so, um, okay, so for SIG, of course, yeah. So we, we are exploring partnerships with um, other parts of ASTAR as well. For example, the Internet of, Industrial Internet of Things Consortium, um, IQ, which is a sister, uh, sister subsidiary or uh, sister initiative of, of ARTC. Um, but we can also now bring this, um, you know, uh, into the, the context of the manufacturer themselves. Um, the manufacturer does not need to be especially in this day and age, does not need to be restricted to any kind of proprietary uh, protocol or uh, solution. Um, because in, in inadvertently, that leads to silos. So you have one silo here and one silo here, and they can't be connected because each one is proprietary. What we are pushing for and what we, what we are so grateful that is, you know, um, we are very much aligned with ARTC, Robesis and, and Arkstone, especially on this, is that democrat uh, democratization of these kinds of solutions. So our solutions need to integrate well with any supplier um, and it needs to be open as well so that other suppliers can communicate with us. So that's something that we, we truly believe in. And, and I think that's the way forward for really a competitive economy. Fantastic. And I think one thing that you hit on that was actually very quite important is standardization and standards. And one of the things that has just recently happened has been there's the, the big conference, uh, which is the uh, uh, Industry Transformation Asia Pacific, uh, ITAP, that has just occurred. And uh, standardization and standards was a very big component of that as well. And I wanted to move back to, to the Rovisys team on this one, because as you go out into the world, you're going to see a million different solutions, a million pieces of software, a million pieces of hardware. How have you been working to try to drive standardization uh, to your customers? Because typically when a customer looks at this and says, you know, I just need solutions A, B, and C to just work, right? I don't really want to listen about the standards. I just want to get this darn thing finished and running. How do you kind of work together, even though maybe, for instance, costing might be a little bit higher, but how do you work with customers to align on the importance of standardization and to select solutions that are indeed going to be open and not going to be kind of locked into this, you know, kind of regret five years later when you realize, oh, now I can't integrate this. Like, how do you get that convincing process going with some of the, the customers that you work with? Right. Um, so in terms of standardization, I think... Um, coming back to the unifying platform that I uh, talked about previously, um, I think some of the pitfalls are going to be, you know, there is going to be a software solution that is going to be good for, um, good for a particular use case, but not so good for, for other use case. So uh, what we can actually bring to the table is the experience of working with multiple, um, uh, multiple platforms, a lot of the platforms that are out there in the market. And you know, I'm 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 very happy to say that you know, like a like a solution like Arstone is really a very open and very uh, scalable solution that we can hack onto and attempt to build build out uh, for the future. I think a lot of uh, a lot of that effort and also understanding and experience really goes into identifying the singular platform that we can use to be building um, um, uh, for our customers and. Uh, adding to the adding to the value is you know what uh, what we have for the domain knowledge in terms of uh, expertise in in pharmaceutical in in petrochemical in agribusiness and all that 
And all of it really comes into something that we can offer as a solution, um, as a complete solution to, to our customers. Right. And I think you hit on a very important point there as well, which is that you make sure that you find the best solution that fits the customer. And I think the beauty of Rovis and the size and the experience that their team has had is that you've seen it all. You've been through it. You know the weaknesses and the, the strengths of particular solutions. And there's no such thing as a one size fits all. So making sure that you're able to work with great folks that have this experience that can recommend the right thing becomes a really critical kind of component of will this project be successful or not. Now, the other point that you hit on also that was very important is the concept of platforms. And I wanted to go back to Dr. Carlos here at the ARTC in terms of platform building, leveraging and using platforms. What are some of the kind of the solutions and, and for example, how do you deal with the platform play within the ARTC? Because one of the key things also at the ARTC is not to be uh, uh, beholden to using a particular instance. You will also go and test everything out. One of the things that I always love whenever people walk through the ARTC is they always ask, why are there so many cobots all over the place? And they're all different brands. And I always love to say is that the whole purpose here is to be able to vet and test to see which one is going to be the best. The intention is that there is no bias, regardless if you are a member or not, you're gonna find the best solution. But in terms of platform plays, how does the ARTC kind of work in this particular area? Well, that's, uh, that's quite interesting, right? Because I think it's true. Uh, in ARTC, we are not bounded to a single technology, a single platform, a single vendor, right? Also, we have our member infrastructure that is supportive on the solutions that they have. Uh, we like to test the solutions out in the market because uh, there is, the first thing, there is a price tag that sometimes you need to reach, right? Uh, the scalability of the price tag is very important because you may be able to find a solution that will work for a couple of machines. But if you want to put this into a big organization that has thousands of machines, then the solution is not anymore uh, cost efficient, right? So also mm, to understand the minimum requirements uh, of the problem that you are trying to solve. To be able to down select which platform, which IoT platform, in this, case, in this particular case, let me just talk about IoT, which IoT box maybe is the most uh, uh, suitable for that case, right? So maybe you don't need the full power of a certain solution that is in the market that will do uh, everything, but you don't know and you don't need that much, right? You maybe need sort of here and there solution that can do this, right? So I think one of the reasons why we are so keen in analyzing those platforms and, and trying to understand those platforms is because we want to give the best answer to, to, to the customers we have, right? So yes, we deal with it. We spend a, a large amount of our research time uh, doing crazy stuff, right? Like for instance, putting two MESs at the same time. And everybody says like, why in the world are you doing that? Because we, we, if, we, if we don't do that, who else is going to do it? We have a full plan here. We can test it. We can tell you what if, right? So we are able to say what if, right? Of course, it is impossible to analyze and to understand all the platforms in the market. There's simply too many of them. But we are able to, to down select the ones that are more relevant to, to the sectors that Singapore is pushing for, right? So I think this is the way we approach this. Uh, we dedicate enough time to understand the, the, the platforms, what they can offer. And then uh, we dedicate enough time to hear what our customers want, right? And then we map it, right? And uh, the other thing is uh, we have a tremendously, uh, a tremendous benefit in the, in the member infrastructure we have. Like we have SIG, right? So of course we, we have access to technologies that SIG is trying to push some of the technologies that SIG maybe is not even in the market yet, so we are actually helping them to, to see how these solutions will map into uh, an FMCG environment, right? And this is something that is very good, right? Because uh, we will be able to not only find the right solution, but to open this solution to new markets that were closed to, 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 to some kind of uh, PLC sensors in the past, right? Very, very, very much uh, uh, in a way that uh, is, is just kind of like, here is the taste it is sweet try to try to try to try to taste it see how it's gone uh, but you don't have to do it in your own factory you can do it in our factory we can test it there we can push it to the limits we can tell you how good it is right and and this is this is actually this is actually something that uh, you cannot do it in a company you need a research center 
uh, because uh, you cannot stop your production, right? So that's 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 why that's why it's, it's, it's so relevant, I believe. I, you bring up a very fantastic point because what essentially the ARTC is, and I think this is the terminology that's used, although sometimes it doesn't fully represent it to its full capabilities, is that it is really your kind of in-house but outsourced research development center. It is your own space where you can test. It is your own area that you can incorporate your existing operations into and validate. So this actually leads to actually a really good question that came from the audience just right now, which is what we've seen is that it's not that people have been, you know, within Singapore, there has been enough grants, enough talk, enough hype over the past couple of years for folks to have tried something or may have tried a couple things already. But then they may not have at the beginning went through an entire process, for instance, like the Siri index and done their homework in-house and may have, for instance, bought something that may not be really you know, uh, open and connected, and you do end up having kind of silent situations around. And I wanted to open it up to the panelists here to see what would be kind of the best practice now, given that I am in a situation where maybe three years ago, I have dabbled into looking at uh, introducing some sensors, I may have dabbled into introducing some automation equipment, um, I might not necessarily have a full fledged MES yet. But then things don't necessarily talk to each other. And we have a situation where one system is OPC UA, another system is Modbus only, and another system, unfortunately, I'm still dealing with text files. What would be, uh, from the standpoint of, let's first go with the the, um, uh, the Rovasys team here and from Chow, to see how would you first tackle that particular problem? What would be a recommendation of, how do you get started? I got three things floating all over the place. Where do I go from there? Right. So, uh, unfortunately, for silo systems, uh, what we're gonna have to do is to tackle it, uh, you know, on on a case case by case basis. So, um, what we have, what our experience has told us is that, you know, out there in the market, market even legacy systems, there is got to be a way to be pulling, um, a way to be pulling the data out, you know, out to, um, you know, for data integration and bringing more value out of those data as well. Um, so far, we have not uh, come across a system that is so tough that we cannot be pulling data uh, out of those systems. Um, at most, we're going to have to introduce new hardware. We try to avoid that, uh, but you know, in the worst case scenario, we're going to have to put in uh, some level of PLC that is, uh, that is cheap or IoT sensors uh, that can actually pull out the data and you know, bring value to the customer. So um, experience-wise, uh, Unfortunately, we just have to go uh, to the tough route. As I've shared earlier, the first step is always the most painful, a painful one, and um, we are here to guide you through that. And I would say that it's actually more painful when you take the wrong first step in this particular case. Right. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the situation here. So, Ethan, I would like to go to you on this one as well, in the sense that you know we talked about a scenario of essentially equipment at some point that's just you know what, it's just not worth the money to go replace the PLC. It's not worth the hassle to go and kind of try to do this integration with the existing system. Uh, what are some of Zix's kind of methodologies uh, and capabilities here then of tackling this particular problem? Because yes, we do have the silos, it's inevitable. I am where I am now. I've already made the investments three years ago. I can't necessarily change that now. What would be kind of the approach that Zix would look at this and say, well, what, what, what can we offer? What will we look at in this case? Um, it, it may actually sound um, a little bit counterproductive, but we actually would recommend um, to go in the direction of decentralized intelligence. Um, what I mean by decentralized intelligence is, is really, um, you know, within silos, you, you have um, a concentration of data collectors, uh, systems which are reading those data, and um, they, they tend to be more centralized. You know, be it centralized to a machine, uh, centralized to the machine control, for example. Um, so by going decentralized, uh, what we would do, for example, um, is we would be, uh, of course, uh, of course, as uh, definitely as Chow mentioned, it would depend on the use case and 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 the the survey. Um, but we would, for example, you know, introduce a, a standalone data collector as a sensor. And now, what I mean by decentralization is really that now we take the intelligence. Um, and we actually put it 
not so much in a central place like like on a server or on on a cloud um but we put it where the machine is for example and and we basically or in other words we basically do edge processing and, and with this we get only the data that we need to get um of, and of course, you know, it takes work to identify uh, and to work with the customer, as I mentioned, to, to understand their KPIs, um, to basically break down those silos. So we understand the KPIs, what do they really want to achieve? And then that allows us to break down the silos by introducing, you know, decentralized applications, uh, intelligence on the edge. And then, um, you know, that data, even on the edge, it can be converted into information. Um, and then, we, we go then into um, maybe on on the on the um, data flow on, on on the on the server level. So now, how do we um, how do we visualize this data? How how do we make it transparent for 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 the for the user? Um, and and one one last thing which I also wanted to mention was that um, as far as possible as well, um, we we can also. Uh, or one, one way would also be to explore the interfaces be, between the different uh, software or the different solutions which are already there. And, and this is definitely another way that we can try to break down those silos. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Edge processing, I think that's something that I think a lot of people when they are jumping into a process, forget that that's an option. And there's a tendency to try to stream everything into the single server and try to run everything there. And there's a lot of inherent disadvantages of that kind of process as well. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And, 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 and finally, last but not least, uh, uh, Dr. Carlos, if you can give us a kind of a same scenario. If I was to suddenly approach the ARTC and say, I got three weird systems running that don't talk to each other, what would be some of the things that I would be able to leverage at the ARTC now to be able to help me and guide me along this journey of getting it integrated at this point? Okay, that's, uh, that's very interesting, actually, because uh, mostly those systems will be different in the sense of the connectivity, right? So uh, we're talking about uh, possible maybe uh, different protocols that uh, have to be taken into place, mm -hmm. right, into action. Uh, so uh, what we have come up with uh, solutions that will allow us to, to be able to interconnect those systems uh, and using standards, by the way, right? And uh, those solutions will present us with the possibility to create like an Esperanto language, right? So, of course, we are using things like uh, asset admin shell from, from the, the Rami 4.0 architecture, right? But uh, the real thing is that uh, the connectivity is bidirectional, right? So, of course, uh, there are lots of challenges into that, but uh, that requires uh, uh, very strong knowledge on the communication protocols that requires very strong knowledge on how these machines will be uh, gathering the information. But uh, I think uh, this, is, this is part of the research we've been doing in the model factory, right? Uh, how to make the system talk to each other, right? Even with systems that are very brownfield, right? Uh, not meant to be connected. So I remember a couple of cases where we had to uh, connect a furnace where uh, basically no PLC. So they only had an HMI. So we came up with a solution that was kind of um, very relevant, easy to do, but will allow us to actually be able to extract the information from a machine. It was just basically using IOC, OCR, yeah? Like a, a video recognition of, of the characters, right? So all those things uh, are making you think in a lateral approach and uh, to present the solutions with, uh, with a kind of a relevant approach to, to what the, the people is needing, right? So I believe uh, it's all about knowing what is going on and in this case, uh, we, we, we are kind of uh, experts on the field, right? And mm -hmm. then second is to know which applications can be used to actually leverage on the application. So uh, do not reinvent the wheel. It doesn't make any sense, right? If we have a company like Arsene doing something that is already in the market, why not to use it, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we have uh, sensors from SIG that are intelligent sensors, right? Using IOLink, for instance, why not to use them, right? Because this is already there, right? So we take, uh, we take pride into making things work in a more, in the more affordable and practical way. And this is the challenge, to make it practical. Fantastic, fantastic. I think what, what everything that has been emphasized here amongst our panelists here is really to say that whatever problem there is that you are facing right now in your digitalization journey, in the process of making Singapore strong in terms of being digitally ready, 
there are the providers here. There's the institutes here. There's the experts here. They are all here. And we are very blessed to be in this particular area where research agencies from hardware providers, systems integrators, software providers are all here to be able to be leveraged on and tapped on. So it's a matter of just reaching out, get out there and be proactive. The strength of Singapore's manufacturing base will rely on the SMEs and MNCs working and collaborating together, pulling solutions that are best of the world, best around and leveraging them and implementing them as quickly as possible to drive that competitive advantage. So thank you very much. I Unfortunately, we're running out of time here. Uh, if we had more time, we could talk for ages. I've known you gentlemen for a very long time already. So it'd be wonderful to continue and I hope we're able to have more additional sessions. But I would like to, first of all, thank everyone for attending today. And again, thank you to uh, Sophia and Spectrum for allowing this platform for us to speak and hopefully it was delightful for all the attendees. I'd like to pass the remaining time back to you, uh, Sophia, for us to close out here. Thank you so Thank you, much. Wilson. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, Axon for this uh, collaboration. Thank you, Chow, Revisis. Thank you, Dr. Carlos, ARTC. Thank you, Ethan from Zeke. Um, I'd like to thank the audience as well. If you want to reach out to any of the speakers, um, you can go through me. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you to join us on the 12th of November. We'll be um, holding another uh, panel session webinar to talk about um, digitalization. Do we know the difference between um, digitalization and digitization? So, and also we'll be discussing three areas of distinction, digital integration, transformation, and optimization. So um, fill up the survey form when you exit from this webinar. I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us this evening and uh, see you and stay well. Thank you very much, everyone. See you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.